We started this series, I don't know, at the beginning of the semester with 10 things God loves and 10 things God hates. Um, and today we're going to look at two more. God loves the righteous and God hates uh, divorce. Hates divorce. I already know some, some bells are chiming, but let's, let's jump into it. We find it in Malachi chapter 2, uh, verse 16. The NIV version says God hates the man who hates, who hates and divorces his wife. The message says, I hate divorce, says the God of Israel, God of the angel of the armies. I hate the violent dismembering. It's pretty simple. Amen. God hates divorce. So if you get married, don't get divorced because God hates that. All right, we're done. Moving on. I'm kidding. Let's pack this. Let's, let's, let's unpack this a little bit. There's not a couple in the world who's gone through any measure of Christian marriage or relationship counseling who has not heard that statement, right? When you, when you go to Christian counseling, when you go to relationship counseling, they're probably going to start you in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 with the whole love chapter, right? Love is patient, love is kind, love is all these beautiful things that you see memes and tweets about, amen? Love is all this wonderful stuff. And then shortly after that, maybe around week three or four in your counseling, they're going to jump you to this verse that says, oh yeah, and God hates divorce, right? So I don't know about you. I love Bible study. I love, I, I love personal Bible study. I love group Bible study. But, and so this idea that God hates divorce made me think, you know what, let me, do a little, let me do a little study because if God hates divorce, then he must love marriage, right? If God hates divorce, then let me find all, let me find all the scriptures that say God loves marriage because naturally if God hates divorce, then he loves marriage. So I started looking for all the verses that said God loves marriage, but then I noticed something in the scripture. I noticed something that was glaring to me. I hope it becomes glaring to you. There's no scripture, there's no text that actually says God loves marriage, and I was like, well, that's weird because if God can definitively say he hates divorce, then he should definitively say he loves marriage. But there's no scripture that says that. Now, there are plenty of scriptures, you all, that esteem marriage, that talk about the function of marriage, that talk about the beauty of marriage, that talk about how marriage is an, example, is an example and an illustration of how God loves the church. There's plenty of those, but there's no scripture that says God loves marriage. Matter of fact, there are some scriptures that say if you can do it, don't get married. I don't, I don't subscribe to that idea. <laughs> Personally, I'm just saying for me. But there's, a, there's actually scriptures that says if you, if you can do it, if you can go through life just giving your entirety to God, giving your entirety to the kingdom, if you can actually do it, then don't even worry about getting married. Just do that. Do kingdom. But there's no scripture that says God loves marriage. So here's the thing. If divorce, that which God hates, isn't so much about marriage as it is about covenant and about vows and about the authority of God's name and God's presence in your life. Divorce isn't so much about marriage as it is about covenant and about vows, and about the authority, the weight of God's name, the weight of God's word in your life. Amen? I think we think, we, 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 we like to simplify things so that we can live with it. We've, we've reduced the idea of divorce as only being, a, being something that happens between people who get married. But listen, even single people, regardless of relationship, individuals, practice acts of divorce all the time. I'm going to show it to you in scripture. Let me, before I go to scripture, let me say this. I know it's kind of ancient history now, but you know, when, when Kim, before Kim Kardashian married Kanye West, right? Before that whole, you know, historical event happened, <laughs> right? She, a little shade. She married this guy named what? Chris Humphreys. Bless his heart. <laughs> she married this guy named Chris Humphrey. They put a million dollars, right, into this wedding. Put it on TV. Declared their love. Declared their devotion to each other. We watched it on TV. We, we watched the pictures. We Googled it. We looked at it. Whether, listen, fellas, you can tell me you didn't go look at it, but you did. Millions of us did. 
went and looked to see Kim, Mary, Chris. And then, 72 short days later, just seven, how many, what is that? 72 days is what? Two months and 12 days. I don't remember what, what month it was, so if it was a leap year, I don't know. But 72, <laughs> 72 short days later, what happened? They got divorced. And people, whether in community or whether singularly, started asking questions like, what, 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 what was that about? What was, well, like, was that for TV? Was that just a sham? How, how, how could we not know that this wasn't gonna work? I, I don't even, I just can't imagine how we didn't know. <laughs> how, do, how could we not predict that that, that that was gonna happen? What about the promise that they made to all their fans? What about the promise that they made to their family? What about the promise that they made to each other? Even the bigger question, what about the promise? What about the vow they made to God? Does that not mean anything? Listen, a wedding is one of the few times that we actually make public vows to God. Amen? Maybe joining the military might be another, but a wedding is kind of one of the times where we actually invite people to come watch us make a vow. Right? So it's, it's sort of like, how, do you, how did you invite us to watch you make a vow? And then 72 days later... It's like the vow thing never actually, it never happened, right? But listen, we make private vows and we quietly make vows to God and each other and to ourselves even all the time. So the question is, again, we're not talking about marriage necessarily. The question really is, how valuable is your vow? How valuable is your vow? How firm is your vow? Or is it negotiable, like on a 72-hour, 72-day clock? How valuable is your vow? We live in a world of negotiable vows, where vows and commitments and faithfulness are negotiable. The promise I make to God and the position that God has in my life, it kind of just depends on how I'm feeling today. It kind of just depends on what's going on. It kind of just depends on the circumstance. It kind of just depends on who looks at me sideways. It kind of just depends. How firm is my vow? We make negotiable vows all the time. And again, not just when it comes to marriage, but even in, as an individual, we ourselves make vows all the time based on what's in our best interest. And God says, I hate when you do that. He says, I hate when you do that. Now, here's the thing. God will let you do that. Of course he will. He'll let you do that. He'll let us do that. But scripture says, but I hate it when you do that. Not only will God let us do that, but God will actually give you your papers to do it. God will give you your hall pass. God will give you your permission. God will say, I hate when you do it. But push come to shove. I will let you do it, and God will give you a certificate of divorce. Now, there's some really interesting texts in the book of Jeremiah that talks about when God gave some people a certificate of divorce. In Jeremiah chapters 1 and 2, let me give you a little background. Jeremiah chapter 1 and 2, God tells Jeremiah to go speak to the people of Israel. And basically, God is just recounting over and over and over how strained and unreliable the devotion of the people of Israel has been. Like any relationship, it starts off nice. It starts off nice and sweet. I love you. I love you too. You're so pretty. You're so handsome. Right? Thank you for thinking of me. I'm always thinking about you. <laughs> right? Like any relationship, it starts off like, yeah. Right? Let's look at it. Let's just look at the progression of this relationship in Jeremiah chapter 2. Uh, in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 2, it says, God says this. This is how it starts. I remember the devotion of your youth. How as a bride, you loved me and you followed me through the desert. Through a land not sown. Yeah. I remember your devotion as a youth, how as a bride you loved me and you followed me through the desert, through a land not sown. A land not sown means wherever I would go, you would go. Whatever I would do, you would do. You's a ride or die. 
You go, where, even if you don't know where I'm taking you, we're going together. That's how this thing is due. That's how we do. That's Jeremiah 2 and 2. Oh, wait. Hey, hey. <laughs> Listen, that's 2 and 2. By 2 and 7, 72 days or so. <laughs> By 2 and 7, things start to get a little different. Verse 2 I mean, chapter 2, verse 7 says, I brought you, God says, I brought you into a fertile land to eat its fruits and rich produce, but you came and you defiled my land and made my inheritance detestable. Wait, wait, what, ha what had happened? What? What's going on? We're all, we just got to verse 7. By verse, thir by verse 11 and 12, God says this, my people have exchanged their glory, God, for worthless idols. And he declares, we should be appalled at that, oh, heavens should shudder with great horror. In other words, God is like, this is how bad this relationship is going is embarrassing. We should be horrified at how bad this is going. You have replaced me with cheap imitations. This is not looking good. Where's that beautiful bride that committed to go wherever God wanted to go? Verse 13, he says, my people have forsaken me for broken cisterns. Cisterns are jars or bowls. He says, you've replaced me for jars that don't even hold water. You've replaced me for things and for people that are not reliable and that are inconsistent, but you want to act like they are, but they're broken. You've replaced me for that. A minute ago, we would go and we could, we could do anything together, but you've replaced me with broken cisterns. And it gets worse. Verse 24, here's, here's the coldest bop. Listen, he calls Israel a swift she-camel and a wild donkey in the desert. Here's what it means, Jess. She's running here and there in heat. My grandma used to say fast, you just fast, guy or girl. Right? He says, any male that pursues her need not tire themselves because why? She's easy to find. This is the bride of my youth who would go with me into a land unsown. He said, she's a swift camel, a, a, a donkey in heat running here and there. And it goes on and it goes on and it goes into verse 29. God pulls the most basic of all relationship questions. God says in verse 29, he says, why do you bring charges against me? You have rebelled against me. In other words, you're mad at me? Come on, we've all had these, relations, these kind of questions. You mad at me? You're out there wilding out. You're out there doing stuff. You're out there carrying broken cisterns and you're mad at me? You mad at, you, you got an issue with me. I'm right here. I'm in the same place I've always been. You, she camel, are all over the place. And what? You mad at me? I'm still in the vow that we set. You, however, my dear, my sir, but you're mad at me? You mad at me, son? For real? Right? And then he drops the drop of all drops. Here we go. Verse, I mean, in Jeremiah 3, you guys are like, it can't get worse. Just listen. Jeremiah 3, let's look at the day God gave Israel his papers, her papers. Jeremiah 3, verses uh, 6 through 8. During the reign of King Josiah, the Lord said to me, have you seen what faithless Israel has done? She has gone up on every high hill and under every spreading tree and has committed adultery there. I thought that after she had done all this, she would return to me, but she didn't. And her unfaithful sister Judah saw it. Verse 8, I gave faithless Israel her certificate of divorce and sent her away because of all of her Adulteries. I gave faithless Israel her certificate of divorce and sent her away because of her adulteries. Here's the thing. God says, what I hate so much is your unfaithfulness to the vow you made to me. You act like it meant nothing, Israel. You act like it did not mean a thing. 
Now here's something, something we have to understand is to give someone a, a certificate of divorce is different than just getting or giving a divorce. Divorce means to put away, to dismiss, to relinquish any regard for. God didn't do that to Israel. God kept his promise, his vow, his commitment, his covenant to Israel, but Israel did not. And they repeatedly lived in such a way that said they would not, didn't and ain't gonna. So God gave them a certificate, in essence, a permission that says, since you're not worried about this vow anyway, go ahead. I'm gonna be right here. I'm gonna be right here. But since I, I can't even pretend with you good though, I can't, I can't do that. So I'm gonna just let you go ahead. I'm going to just let you go, go ahead. God says, I hate when you treat me and your vows as negotiable. When you mess up or when you go astray or when you sin or when you backslide or when you trade my love for cheap knockoffs, God says, I don't divorce you. I don't put you out. I don't change my vow to you. But clearly your vow to me has changed. And I hate it. I hate it so much. So here you go. Here's your certificate. Sad thing is, before God gave them this certificate, they were already gone. They were already acting like it didn't matter. God did not divorce them, but he just wasn't going to go along with the pretense anymore. The scripture says that Israel's behavior was so bad that it was becoming contagious to everybody who saw it. We're going to that. I will make vows to God and I will keep them. Amen. When God says he hates divorce, what he hates is our flippancy with vows. What he hates is our flippancy with covenant. If he gives us a certificate of divorce, it's not because he wants to. It's because it's clear that that's what we want anyway. Let me go real fast to what God loves. God loves the righteous. Look at this verse. Psalm 146 uh, verse 8, it says, the Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. What I love about this text right off the top is this, you guys. It says, the Lord gives sight to the blind, the lost. It says, the Lord lifts up those who are bowed down, the depressed, those who are struggling. And then right on the heels of that, it says that the Lord loves the righteous. In the same breath as the lost and blind, as the struggling, as the depressed, as the bowed down. In the same breath, God says, and I love the righteous. It indicates to me that maybe the lost, the depressed, the bowed down, the struggling are not actually all that far off from the righteous. Amen? Over the last couple of weeks, I've had a couple conversations with uh, Josh and, and with Sierra, and we've been talking about this word righteous or what it means to be righteous. And I said to both of them, I think we've kind of distorted or confused or mixed up what it means to be righteous, because often we've said righteous is perfect, is uh, uh, flawless, is, uh, is, 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 is there's no wrong in you, right? And we've said that that's what righteousness or holiness is is, that it's moral perfection. But I struggle with that. I take issue with that. And here's why. Because the Bible calls a lot of people righteous who are really messed up. The Bible calls a lot of people righteous who had some serious flaws, who had some serious isms, who had some serious uh, uh, dys dysfunctions to them and maybe even to their family. Noah was called righteous, but he got drunk and declared a curse over his son. Abraham was called righteous, but he lied twice about his wife being his sister. Lot and Job were both called righteous, but they weren't necessarily the best examples of how to pick friends or wives. David was called righteous, but he struggled with ego and pride and adultery and murder. Rahab is in the righteous lineage of Jesus, but obviously she was a prostitute and a little bit of a schemer. So I have a hard time saying that righteous means perfect and righteous means flawless and righteous means that there's nothing wrong with you. But God says, I love the righteous. So I want you to look at righteous in this simple, simple way. In this simple way. Righteous is a degree to which you are God or Christ conscious. You are God concerned. You are God centered. 
Righteous is a degree to which you are God conscious, God concerned, God Christ centered. It's a state of mind that says I'm always conscious, concerned, and centered around what God thinks about who I am and about what I'm doing. Whatever state I'm in, I care about what God thinks about it. I might not get it right, but I care what God thinks about it or what God thinks about me. God loves the righteous, and why wouldn't he? Don't we all care about the people who care about us? Don't we all care about the people who care what we think? I heard this old adage one time. I heard this adage that said that when we're initially falling in love with people, we're not actually falling in love with that person. We're actually falling in love with how that person makes us feel about ourselves. Right? When you first are falling, have that nice way that you're falling in love, you're not necessarily falling in love with that person. You're just still getting to know them. But something about them and something about how they consider you and how they're concerned about you and how they care about you makes you feel good about you. So it doesn't, it's no surprise that God would say, I love the righteous because the righteous care about what I care about. And he says, I love the righteous. Last thing, and I know we got to go. Here's an interesting story in Genesis chapter 18 where, 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 where the decision to destroy two cities of Sodom and Gomorrah is on the table, right? God says they, they don't care about what I think at all. They're not concerned about what I care about. They're not concerned about life from, from my perspective. They don't care, and I'm just going to destroy the two cities. It's just got to go. And Abraham steps up and he says, God, if I can find 50 righteous people, Will you spare the city? And God says, if you can find me 50, Abraham, 50 righteous, 50 people who care about what I care about, who are concerned about what I'm concerned about, if you can find me 50, I'll spare it. Abraham looks, he can't find 50, goes back to God. If I can find 45, yeah, if you can find 45, Abraham, I'll spare the city. Goes back. If I can find 40, God, okay, if you can find 40, I'll spare that, because I love the righteous so much. If you can find 40 out of two old cities, I'll spare, the, I'll spare all of them. He couldn't find 40. He goes back to God. God, if I can find 30. Yeah, if you can find me 30. If if I can find you 20, God. God says, yeah, if you can find me 20 righteous people who love me, who care about what I care about, who think like I think, who are concerned about what I'm concerned. If you can find me 20 people like that, I'll spare it. Couldn't find 20. Gets to 10. Says, God, if I can find just 10 people who care about what you care about, who are concerned about your concern, who think like you, who want to think like you, who are interested in what you're in. If I can find 10, will you spare these two cities? God says, I love the righteous so much. If you can find me 10, 10 out of two cities, if you can find me 10, I'll, I'll back off. Abraham couldn't find 10, could not find 10. But what's more important is if he could have found 10, God would have said, I love those so much that I'll back off. God loves the righteous. God hates when we make vows that we don't keep to each other, to ourselves, to him. And God absolutely loves the righteous. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. God, let me care about what you care about. Let me think about what you think about. Let me make a vow and let me keep it. In Jesus' name.